Hi, good morning, everyone, or afternoon as we're shifting into it. Uh, my name is Julie Hannes. I'm Director of Strategic and Public Interest Communications at the Institute on the Environment. And it is my honor and pleasure to welcome you to our second People and Planet conversation this semester. We, the Institute on the Environment, launched People and Planet in 2020 as a space to have wide ranging conversations about the human, um, natural systems and climate intersections that are shaping our world. And today's conversation about working across disciplines and ways of knowing and other boundaries, I think is a great example of this. Our biggest challenges globally require and hinge on being able to work together in this way because it requires solutions are gonna require everybody bringing their expertise and their perspectives and their insights into the mix. This is why the Institute on the Environment exists as a standalone institute and is not housed inside of any disciplinary structure like a college or a school at the university. And our panelists today, who I'm gonna introduce in a moment, hail from across the university and bring a wealth of knowledge about this type of cross-cutting work, why it matters and how to do it well. So I, um, I'm gonna serve as your moderator today. And in a moment, I'm gonna introduce, as I said, the rest of our panelists. First, however, I want to begin by acknowledging that our University of Minnesota system has campuses that are located on the traditional and treaty land of the Dakota and Anishinaabe peoples. Tribes were forced to cede this land and our university as a land grant institution has benefited from this dispossession. We sometimes um, describe the Institute as a scholarly community committed to building a sustainable future. And saying that, asserting that demands questions like with whom, in what ways? And we say this is complex work and it, it's not ours alone. And that's a theme that I expect we're going to return to in today's conversation. And so we acknowledge both past and present injustices and the people on whose land we live, learn, and work as a university community, as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with the 11 tribal nations in Minnesota. Institutionally, as part of the University of Minnesota, we also acknowledge that words are not and never enough. Um, Dakota, Ojibwe, and other indigenous knowledge systems are crucial ways of knowing. And we must ensure that our university provides support, resources, and programs that increase access to all aspects of higher education for our American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. And this is work to which INE as part of our university is really committed. So before we shift to our discussion, I also have a couple of logistical notes. If you have questions for our speakers, and I hope you do, um, because they're incredible people and you should ask your questions. We are reserving some time toward the end of the discussion and you can enter those questions through the Q&A function. We will try to answer as many as we can. Um, I believe Kimberly has also noted in the chat that uh, closed captioning is enabled and available. And we're also recording this conversation and we will share it along with any resources we mentioned in a follow-up message later this week. So, I think I've covered everything logistical. Uh, let's, let's embark on our main event. Our topic today, as I said at the top of the introduction, delves into the importance of working across disciplines and boundaries, known as an interdisciplinary working approach. And each of our panelists brings a unique perspective to this type of work within the University of Minnesota. So let's get going. Um, panelists, please feel free to turn on your cameras and join me here in the Zoom. And uh, I'm going to introduce you all, and then we'll start our conversation. Um, Dr. Emilius N. White, Jr. is Interim Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the College of Liberal Arts. Welcome, Emilius. And has played an integral role in the creation of the college's Liberal Arts Engagement Hub. Uh, Christine Baumler is a professor and chair of the Department of Art and a fellow of the Institute on the Environment. And Laurie Moberg is the editor of Open Rivers, Rethinking Water, Place, and Community at the Institute for Advanced Study, and she is also an associate of the Institute on the Environment. Uh, so welcome. Welcome, everybody. So. 
get us started, and as maybe a, a little twist on introducing yourselves and telling those who have joined us today more about who you are and what you bring to this work, I want to ask like a brass tacks grounding question because um, I think it's always important before we dig deeper into the conversation for everyone who's joined us to sort of have a, a chance to hear from your perspective, what are we here to talk about? So I'm going to turn it over to the panelists and ask, what is your definition of, or how do you think about interdisciplinarity? And how does that show up for you in your role at the university? Who, who would like to go first on that? I'm happy to. Um, Okay, so I think about interdisciplinarity as um, sort of as you put it a little bit earlier, Julie, the crossing, um, thinking across, crossing borders, crossing boundaries, ways of thinking um, across disciplines. And I would also say thinking across um, or beyond disciplines. So thinking with community partners, that's often called transdisciplinary work, um, but including different ways of knowing and different kinds of expertise in the work. Um, and I also think it's about being, it's, it's more than just uh, being able to think across those things, but it's being open to that and being willing to exchange with other people. Um, and in that, in this way, I think it's sort of, it's, it's an innovative and transformative and, and a catalyst for not only changing how we do the work, um, but also what we think is important about what we're contributing. And how in your role with Open Rivers, how do you feel that that is part of your work and grounding in your day to day? Sure. Um, so I want to start by saying with the Institute for Advanced Study, this is sort of a founding principle for the organization, um, for the institute that Open Rivers is part of. Um, so we work, uh, we're one of the interdisciplinary centers that's system wide. So we work with, um, you know, folks all across the system campuses and, um, their, and their community partners as they're doing work. We have you know, faculty fellows and research collaboratives and all kinds of different kinds of interdisciplinary work. So I feel like I'm surrounded by this kind of work all the time. Um, in Open Rivers, uh, we started this journal um, in 2015. I was part of that, that group that started the journal um, with the idea of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity at its core. Um, so the journal was designed as a space to draw together the works of scholars, practitioners, activists, um, artists, scientists, policymakers, community members, professionals, everyone who's doing work around water, place, and community, and offer um, a space where people can talk across the boundaries of their of their fields. Um, and part of that is also making sure that the work is then accessible. Um, so that's a big part of what we do is to make it public scholarship so that it is accessible to people across all these disciplines um, to catalyze their thinking a little bit differently. Uh, and, I, and I think for me, this is a commitment to um, cultivating a space where the conversations can grow, fed by this kind of intermingling of different expertise and different ways of knowing. Amelia, Sir Chris, I'm wondering what resonates for you in that? What's your, how do you think about interdisciplinarity? When, um, when I think about uh, interdisciplinarity, I don't, I don't know if I have a, a clear definition or I've ever made one, but if I did, uh, I think it would include, you know, bringing together different academic disciplines uh, and ways of thinking about an issue or a problem to create something that might not be possible if we were just working within kind of disciplinary silos. And the, and the something could be an event. It could be, you know, trying to solve a, a, a complex problem it could be kind of a mode of inquiry. It could be a way of presenting information or any number of other of other things. And in your role as past and present, how has that informed your work? Well, so um, I'll, I'll say this, and I when I say this, it, it surprises me because I work my entire career at an institution of higher education. For, for several years, I've worked in the College of Liberal Arts, but I'm the first to say I'm not an academic. Uh, you know, mo I'm an administrator who supports the work of academics and others. And, you know, I work to support community-engaged scholarship. I am not a community-engaged scholar. So 
Um, I, but the way I did my work as an administrator during most of my career and including my time in CLA, I didn't use the term interdisciplinary, but I would work with people across different offices and different units across different colleges and even sometimes outside of the university in order to get things done, you know, and so to me at a, at a basic layperson's level, it just makes, it makes sense. Uh, and so I'm used to working with people in different offices who have a piece of a, of a problem, you know, uh, it happened when I was in student affairs, it happened when I worked in the regent's office, it happens in, in CLA. Uh, and so, um, you know, that what, what in this context, you know, we call interdisciplinarity is really just about working across whatever barriers and boundaries there are to get people in a room who can help you do what you're trying to do. Because most things that we're trying to do, we can't do. If we could if we could take care of it by ourselves, then it really probably wouldn't really be a, a problem. Someone just needs to make a decision and do it and done. Everything else we need to engage with other people. And so uh, whether it's simple or trying to address a complex issue or challenge, so yeah, that's how I how I think about it. I love what you just said there. You're accustomed this framework of like everybody holds a piece of a problem. Uh, I was thinking about as I prepared for this conversation today. You know, we've got interdisciplinarity. We're rolling out like what eight syllables to talk about something that at its core is really just about coming together and putting yeah. different pieces and forms of expertise on the table. Um, Chris. I'm wondering for you, um, how do you think about it and how does it show up for you in your work? Well, thank you. And I, I'll build on just the wonderful words of Lori and Amelius. But um, for me, I really like the way you framed the title of this talk around the word synergy. And I looked up the etymology of the word synergy and it's about working together. Um, but I also think it implies a sense of excitement and energy that's generated through collaboration. And um, so I think about interdisciplinarity as synergistic collaboration so that each person, as Lori and Amelius were saying, you know, brings the depth of their knowledge of their own discipline, their cultural and lived experience to the collaboration, different ways of knowing. And one thing I'm really appreciating about my students right now is this intergenerational perspective which they're bringing to the table when we collaborate with them as well. Um, and I think um, for me as an artist, the imagination is at the center of collaboration and that we are co-creating something new together and that these interdisciplinary collaborations are more than the sum of their parts. So that's another way that I would think the word synergy works, that what we achieve together could not be achieved by any piece of the institution or organization or class or artistic collaboration. We all have something to contribute. And I, I think at its core too, I think valuing what each person brings to the table is really important. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm hearing, I'm hearing a lot of interesting things in your answers. Um, I'm hearing the idea of openness, to thinking in this way, working in this way. Um, Chris, you just talked about it requires valuing um, different ways of knowing and different forms of expertise. And to that end, being able to see and recognize um, different ways of knowing and expertise. I also just wanna say, I love what you just said about enjoying the intergenerational collaboration because you just sort of exploded the concept of interdisciplinarity from, oh, it's about disciplines or forms of expertise to other dimensions that we bring to this type of work. And I wanna tie together, you know, Chris, I heard you talking about, you know, something that's more than the sum of its parts. And Amelius, you said, you know, doing something that wouldn't be possible in any other way. Are there other reasons that, you know, those strike me as two really important reasons why this work is important, um, why working in this way is important, because it can do something that is not possible otherwise. 
So it's a very long preamble to asking, are there other reasons you think that working in this way um, is important or do you want to elaborate more on why do you do this? Why is this work important? Well, I'll just say that um, one of the collaborative courses I teach is a climate change course with Professor Rebecca Montgomery from the School of Forestry. And we've been teaching this uh, collaborative course since 2016 on art and climate change. And it really has brought home to me the fact that working on challenges like climate change and climate justice and environmental justice, it just can't be approached through one lens or one discipline. It's not going to succeed. And I think around climate change, we have a sense of urgency that this is something really important that we have to address, you know, immediately. And I think, you know, that's something that um, I see in my classroom where so many of the students are actually from the sciences and from the business school and from all across the university. And they're all coming together with this shared passion and commitment to, you know, have an impact about the future around climate change. So I just think it's, it's just critically important that some of these major challenges that we're facing we're doing collaboratively. I don't really see any other way that it's it's going to work, quite frankly. And and I might add, um, when I think about it in some ways, it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, just again, if I think about whether you're in an academic institution or you're working in a corporation or in a school, it just makes sense, you know, if that to to reach out and work with other people who have different perspectives and, and areas of expertise. The the other piece that that I think is important just from a, you know, in the in the DI space, there's a value in, in learning about people with different lived experiences. Chris mentioned uh different lived experiences. In the same way, if you're if you're engaged in this kind of work, I may know no, nothing about forestry because it's not I've never taking a class, it's not what I do. But if I'm part of, you know, what what Chris was just talking about, I learned something about forestry. I can I can introduce other people to what I learned. You know, I it gives you more information about, again, this world around you. And you can help be a bridge and explain, well, why are you working with a forestry person? Well, this is this is why. Or someone says, why are you, why is an artist involved in this project? you know, well, this is why. And so again, your, you know, as we're all learning, we learn things about these other disciplines and other ways of knowing and approaching problems that then we can share and advocate for in our, in our formal work, but even just our, our casual conversations and, you know, around the water cooler or at a, at an event or with, with a small talk with friends based on, Kind of what we what we've learned so i think that's it that's a it's not the primary reason to do it but it is a is a great externality yeah and it strikes me that that also that learning process also in turn you know enriches your own understanding of your work and how you might think about it um it sounds like a really virtuous cycle to me Lori, do you have anything you want to add or think about you know why working in this way is important? I, I would just add, I mean, I think this is kind of echoing, but I'll just add, there's a um, kind of building on Chris's, what you mentioned earlier, Chris, about this being more than the sum of its parts. There are things that happen with this kind of work that you can't anticipate. Um, there's this sort of emergence um, and, and some of the outcomes. So it's not just about, well, if we put this discipline and this you know, person who knows in this way and this person together, we'll have the solution. But it's like, put all of this together and who knows what might come out of it. And, and some of that creative creativity, I think, is, and generativity is really useful. Thank you. So I wanna, um, actually, we're gonna take a little pivot over to an audience question that is very closely related to where we plan to go next in this conversation. Um, so no, no big surprise here, it just works in really well. Um, because we've talked about, you know, what your definition of this work is. We've talked about why it's important. And it sounds like the audience is like, okay, give me an example of like what this type of work is. 
And so I am curious if I can um, ask anyone who wants to share, or well, I hope more than one of you wants to share, um, what's an example of an interdisciplinary project that you have either been part of or you know are aware of in your network that you think of as a real success and sort of what you take away from that example? Let's bring some concreteness to our conversation. I appreciate that you're all so generous to each other that nobody wants to jump in. Um. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll jump in and um, I'll just uh, maybe talk about the current collaboration that I've been working on since 2016, which is the Backyard Phenology Project. And the word phenology is the scientific term for the biological changes in the seasons, you know, when the trees, uh, leaves turn red or when the flowers bloom. So, uh, and this project uh, was started with Rebecca Montgomery, again, School of Forestry, May Davenport, Beth Mercer Taylor. But over the years, it has, um, it's a climate change storytelling project. And we have a little uh, camper, a, a re rehabbed camper called the Climate Chaser, which functions as a, a little studio that we record people's stories in. And I would say that this collaboration has brought both the science side, you know, to record what's happening and what's changing in our environment. But then there's also been an artistic element as well, um, just in terms of a socially engaged art practice, but also we've uh, sponsored events where people get to experiment with with natural dyes and um, do drawings. And, um, you know, so there, there's different uh, dimensions to it, depending on who's engaged in the project at the time. And then I would say additionally, because we've gathered probably over six or 700 stories since 2016, really our audience are collaborators too. So it's not just the people who are on the team, but also the people who we speak to, who we've recorded, and then over that time, we've really gotten a picture, not only about what's changing in the environment, but how people's attitudes are changing toward the whole topic of climate change. So there's sort of a, a meta understanding of how people are starting to understand climate change and start to relate to how it's impacting their own lives. I love that idea of sort of not just an interdisciplinary project is like a moment in time, but this longer arc of what you're learning and discovering through it. Um, Amelia, Sir Lori, how about you? What's an example of a project that is coming to mind? Project initiative, I realize I'm putting containers around that and I, I don't intend to. Um, I'm happy to share, I'll, I'll share a couple of really short examples. So, um, uh, I was the project manager for the um, Mellon Funded Environmental Stewardship Place and Community Initiative for a few years recently. Um, and that grant was about integrating indigenous ways of knowing into um, environmental education uh, broadly and um, had a strong community engagement component. And um, so I'm gonna give just one example from that project that I think worked really well. So there, um, there was a cohort in Duluth uh, which included someone from American Indian Studies and um, Earth Science and Engineering and someone from Education and a couple of graduate students and a community partner um, from the city of Duluth and um, someone who worked in um, children's curriculum. And together they created the Indigenous Women's Water Sisterhood, uh, which is now a nonprofit organization. Um, they started uh, they did a lot of work with the city of Duluth to rename um, what used to be the Martin Trail. It's now the um, Wabashay Shikana Trail uh, or Wabashay Shikana. Um, and it has indigenous signage and, uh, and a an outdoor classroom and um, ceremony space. Um, oh, I should mention that there were in that two of the faculty involved were indigenous and most of the participants in that cohort were indigenous. So it was really an indigenous led sort of um, set of activities and and I just was really impressed with the way that they were able to create um, some really enduring impacts from the work they they had um, yeah and I just thought that was a really neat component of the way that they did that together um, 
yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, you know, the example I would provide, uh, and this kind of following off of uh, Chris's example, because it involves art too, uh, there's a program that uh, is connected to the liberal art, or was connected, so I think it was last year, to the Liberal Arts Engagement Hub, which uh, briefly exists to provide both space and funding sometimes to support collaborations between the university and the community, uh, particularly with regard to the arts and humanities and humanistic social sciences to kind of address common problems. And uh, they have a program where they provide what they call a residency. And there's a program that was provided a residency uh, in the 22-23 academic year called Voice Division. Uh, and Voice Division uh, is, a, is a collaborative project that's about providing opportunities for people who have been, ex who have experienced and survived genocide uh, to share uh, what they've experienced in ways that might help other people think about these issues and they use art. Uh, and so uh, the folks who participate in this program, uh, this initiative, which has been in existence probably for about, I think it's almost 20 years, uh, but they were engaged with the, the hub for a while. Uh, the stories of the, of the survivors are shared through through dialogue and then those those stories are transformed into art. Uh, visual art could be painting, drawing, collages, mixed media, or sometimes music that can be uh, uh, a part of that. And, and um, these pieces are collaboration between a team of artists and and those who've survived uh, genocide. And as they share their experiences um, and they share their ideas, they, you know, they, they work to decide what should become of that. Over the course of this entire uh, initiative, and I said it's, it's, it's about 20 years old, there have been about 200 pieces of art that have, that have uh, come to this. And you know, the, the goal is to, to use visual arts as well as music in some cases, and the tools of dialogue to, to investigate, recover, and protect, and pro protect their own narrative and emotional experiences. Uh, I think one of the one of the key outcomes is those artworks and what they mean to people provide a way to to talk about awful things uh and those conversations they could happen in a class they could happen in the context of an art exhibit that's on campus in the community they could happen within the context of somebody's family you know just having conversations uh with 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 folks i recently had a, a opportunity to visit uh, some historical landmarks in the South related to the civil rights movement uh, where bad things have happened. And, and one of the things that came up with some of the people we engaged with was that uh, it was not uncommon for their elders to really not talk about what happened during Jim Crow or those who are old enough to have uh, family members who, you know, grandparents or great grandparents who might have been enslaved or 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 sharecrop, they didn't really talk a lot about it because they didn't, you know, they didn't want to share that with the the next generation. And I think about a project like this that provide per, perhaps provides an opportunity to talk about that in a way that uh, might be helpful and help people understand things that they didn't experience themselves, but people they care about do. So that that would just be be one example, uh, you know, that brings together people across the arts, but also in our in our um, you know academic unit within the college that focuses on 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 genocide and Holocaust studies. You know, again, parts of the college you might not think would work together, uh, and we often don't think that art can be part of helping to address problems versus something you just go to do and see when you have some free time. Uh, and so this is a great example of that. That is a great example. And thank you everyone for sharing all of those great examples. You know, I'm really struck by um, what I hear 
in this. Okay. Oh, full disclosure, I am a director of communications. How we communicate, how we connect is an area of perhaps extreme interest for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, of course, I'm picking up on this, but I, I, it's interesting how much you're all mentioning interdisciplinary spaces as, you know, story exchange and also creating space where we can communicate with each other. Um, and how that is creating some sort of um, like access and ability to work on things together because of bringing in these different ways to both collaborate and communicate and then exchange ideas and feelings and creativity with each other. And so I'm wondering as a follow-up question, you know, Laurie, at the beginning, you mentioned this idea of openness, um, what skills or mindsets or strengths do you see in really successful interdisciplinary collaborations or spaces? If just one comes to mind, um, you see people demonstrating this or expressing that. What do you see when it goes well? I would just say, and again, if I think about an answer to an earlier question about just the way in which, not using the term interdisciplinary, but just the way that I've worked, uh, so much of my work is based on relationships and and respectful relationships and trusting relationships. And I think these co interdisciplinary collaborations, they come about either because people have relationships that could be characterized as trusting and respectful, um, or they're able to build those relationships, which again, then allow them to do this work. So I think relationships at the core, but it be it's but it's beyond just knowing somebody. There has to be that that foundation of of respect and and trust uh, to to particularly when engaging with with folks in the community, but even within the institution or the, the university, but yeah, so I would, relationships I think is a core part. Mm -hmm. Chris or Laurie, do you have things you wanna add about strengths or mindsets that people bring to this work? Well, I, I just wanna underscore what Amelia said about relationships, because I do think that is so core to uh, successful collaboration and building that trust. And I found that like with backyard phonology, one of the things I really have enjoyed about it, it's been open to new undergraduate students or graduate students or faculty. And so I feel like it's always growing and changing. So having that kind of curiosity um, about, you know, something new that we might try. Um, I also just want to appreciate the hub residency because backyard phonology um, participated with the hub and we had two undergraduate students. We took the climate chaser over to the Riverside Tower neighborhood um, at Cedar Riverside. And it was the students who interviewed the elders in that community. And I feel like there was a different kind of conversation that happened. Um, again, a kind of intergenerational conversation and cross-cultural conversation. And if those two young people hadn't been the ones asking the questions, I think it would have been a different kind of conversation. So I think, you know, like just having a structure, but also um, maintaining flexibility and um, having these platforms like the hub residency, like the Institute for Advanced Study, like Institute on Environment, they provide a wonderful like nexus for different faculty and students to come together and um, I think having that administrative piece that helps support the work so that we as artists and faculty and students can go about building those relationships and building them in a durational way over time is really beneficial. So shout out to, to those three um, organizations for the great work you've done. Mm -hmm. And the climate chaser, the climate chaser is your camper that the project uses as sort of a mobile storytelling and recording studio. Yeah. Yes. And, and one of the ideas behind that was 
the idea that we would go to communities rather than having communities come to us. So that's one of the reasons that it was thought of as a mobile way to gather stories. So it's been up to the white earth um, tribal community and to different festivals around the city and um, state. So it, it just, it, instead of expecting people to come to us, it's an idea of we, us going to, into community and hearing from people who live there, work there, farm there. Um, yeah, so that's part of the intent of that particular collaboration. Very cool. I'm just going to echo to you that um, the, the relational element and um, that's how we talk about all the work we do at, at Open Rivers too, even with our with writers, we're talking about that as building relationships with them because the work, um, it, the relationships matter as much as sometimes as the, the work itself. Um, and I'm going to echo something that Chris has said. I think, Chris, you've said this before, um, relational and durational, and those two components being elements of, of success. Um, and I also think, uh, especially with community engaged work, um, it can be a really humbling experience um, to hear other kinds of expertise and other ways of thinking about things that might disrupt how um, how we think about things in our disciplines. And, and I think that's really useful. Um, but I also think the most successful projects then are often community driven and, and driven by community interests and needs. Um, that idea of humility has been on my mind as well as you all have been talking just in terms of what does it take to, especially inside of a structure like a university, which is so, um, you know, it, a lot of it is structured and oriented toward building up expertise and creating deep wells of knowledge to then step back and say, I'm just one piece, I'm one part, I'm one view on that problem, as Amelia had said at the beginning of our conversation. Um, I wanna ask a question that weaves in a little bit to some of the questions we're receiving in the Q&A, which is, um, we had some folks curious about, you know, I asked you to share a success story, but also there are, you know, negative outcomes or challenges or wrinkles along the way in this work as well. And so I'm curious to open up the floor to y'all um, to talk a little bit about challenges or barriers that hinder this type of cross-cutting collaboration. What gets in the way? What's hard? I mean, I'll start with a really um, sort of straightforward one, which is, um, that this kind of work often, um, you know, takes time to build relationships and the work moves at the speed of trust. And that is often not in alignment with uh, semesters or academic years or funding cycles. Um, and so sometimes success looks a little different if your focus is on the relationship as opposed to a particular kind of outcome. Mm -hmm. Work moves at the speed of trust and trust Trust answers to trust. <laughs> yeah, you can't accelerate trust. And I would I would build on that. Um, and I think, you know, Chris kind of alluded to this too, but, you know, relationships are important. They move at the speed of trust and um, building relationships take time. They, it's not like you have a meeting and the, the relationship is built. Uh, I, a couple of years ago, I was at a, an event at the, the Liberal Arts Engagement Hub and uh, and it was recognizing folks who had uh, hub residencies. And I had a, had an epiphany because sometimes I struggle to like explain what I do to people, even to people I worked very closely with, but people outside of the college and the university. And while sitting there, you know, s several of the, folks who had successfully applied for residencies were people that I had or organizations that I had connected with at various points in previous years you know and again that initial connections was not a were not about oh I'm talking to you so that you can apply for a hub residency in three years from now but it's connecting with people, it's engaging with them, it's keeping in touch with them. And then there might be an opportunity to like, oh, hey, here's an opportunity that might be of interest. Uh, 
which they wouldn't have known about in the absence of that relationship. So relationship building, and I think this is hard within an institution, it takes time. You can't always quantify, you know, the the cost, whether it's the time cost, whether it's you paying for somebody's lunch, uh, just the things to build a relationship and build that trust. Uh, and you and so re recognizing that it it just takes time uh and you don't always know you know it's it's not necessarily just a transactional thing the other thing the other part i think is important particularly in the college where i work and where chris works in the college of liberal arts we are a large college 22 buildings across both sides of the mississippi river 30 something departments and that can be a barrier. I was was talking to a, a, a faculty member who had seen another faculty member who's uh, now uh, not working here at the college anymore, but uh, Catherine Squires, who was in the Department of Communication Studies. And but the way in which they referred to them, it was clear they didn't know each other. You know, there was like, yeah, there was this woman and she was on this panel. And I I was surprised they didn't know each other because while their disciplinary work is different, and areas of, of scholarship, but they're they're like-minded in, in many ways. They're both community engaged, but literally one was in a department on the East Bank and one was in a department on the West Bank. And they they had never met, uh, which surprised me, you know. And so I think literally just how physical space and how we're organized and whose office is near yours, what department, you know, that that creates some barriers to to enter, particularly collaborations that involve faculty or staff that can create some barriers. Oh, Emilius, you're giving me a flashback to when <laughs> I started at the university, which is just over seven years ago now. And somebody said to me, it will probably take you two or three years to really understand all the different pieces of how this place works because it's so much vaster than, than it's just a vast and complex organization. Um, and at the time I was like, oh my God, what? I'm gonna be like adrift at sea for two years. Um, I was not adrift, but it did take me years to really start even to understand the full lay of the landscape. And so then when you think about in this context and especially when we are also including engagement and interaction and partnerships outside of the university and asking those partners to also, you know, it's it's just a ton to navigate. It's it's very true. Um, I actually, this might be a nice segue to our next question. And then I want to shift over to more audience questions, which is, what are your ideas? What is it, what is your wish list? We will take this segment of our conversation and we will channel it straight to the decision makers and powers that be. Um, how can universities and institutes and institutions and units within them um, support these endeavors? How can we be better structures and infrastructures for this type of work? The, the word that you used, infrastructure, is so important. Mm. And, and infrastructure doesn't always mean physical. Uh, when I was first hired into my initial role in the college as the director of public engagement, there were specific kind of initiatives and projects I was supposed to work on. And then a couple of years in, as I say, I realized what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, and again, this was a new role. But, you know, the, what I was supposed to be doing is helping to create an infrastructure to support the public engagement work that I'm not doing, but Chris and her colleagues across the college at the faculty and staff level are doing, you know, and so the liberal arts engagement hub is infrastructure. It's, it's something that, you know, knock on wood will outlast any of us, you know, it's not about, it's a physical place uh, to do this work, which is a, which is an important part of infrastructure. Space is important. There's funding. Uh, that's another part. One of the things you hear as a barrier in the community engagement space, but I think also in the in the interdi interdisciplinarity space, is about incentives, 
particularly for faculty, and incentives and reward and recognition. So, you know, if you're if you're on the tenure path, uh, is it worth your time? Are you told it's worth your time to do these projects and engage with people outside of your discipline uh, and build relationships? So how do we provide incentives and recognition and reward for folks who are doing this work? I think is 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 important. And again, a lot of that is just part of the the infrastructure. So it's not based on whoever's in a role at a specific point in time, but it's it's part of how the college, the institution works in this space. I really what you said about it not just being dependent on whoever's in a role in a moment in time, um, that really resonates for me. At the Institute on the Environment, we sometimes talk about, you know, individuals hold relationships, but how can we start to support and co-hold those relationships as an institution as well, so that it is not just, well, Julie was here and we did this stuff and then she left and it stopped. A, a, a core something I've learned at the university working here a long time in many ways we build things around people mm. and, and individuals and then when those individuals leave things falter because mm. they left and then it's not a priority of whoever the new person or the new person doesn't know how to do it uh doesn't have the relationships versus kind of making them that these things will continue regardless of who's working in those roles or who's working here. Mm -hmm. That is an insight. And uh, just to pick up on what Amelia's just said, and um, I'm going to just be specific here because I think that the Grand Challenges curriculum has been such a wonderful way to co-teach with people from different disciplines. And, you know, there are real impediments to co-teaching, you know, to have two faculty members in the classroom um, and now that grand challenges, as I understand, is sunsetting, um, I hope that the university will figure out other ways to support that kind of co-teaching, because I think that it's really a unique experience to be in the classroom, not only with another faculty member who's, you know, has just such depth of experience in their discipline and field, but I think it also draws in students from different colleges into those classrooms. And so then the students have a really rich, you know, um, interdisciplinary experience, just talking to each other and getting to know what the other person is doing in their chosen field and discipline. So I do hope that we figure something out as a uh, a college and as a university about how to foster, because I think we did have a infrastructure and system that is going away. So what, what can we do to replace that? So there isn't that kind of gap in the future. Mm -hmm. Laurie, what are your thoughts on how we could better support this work? Um, so I'm thinking a lot about, um, a truth project in this actually, and some of the work that they've really drawn the university's attention to. And um, I think, I mean, I think that's for me, the thing that needs that that will make community engaged work better is um, here or more supported is for the, for, I mean, institutions like IME, IS, the hub, like they're part of confronting um, sort of the legacies of these institutions and practices. Um, and finding better ways to do it. And I think that's a, a, an important piece. Mm -hmm. And I see that Kim just added the link to the Truth Project, um, a story about it in the IAS website into the chat for people who are not familiar with that work. I encourage you to check out these resources. And also as a reminder, we will share these links and the things that were mentioned in our um, email follow-up afterwards as well. And it just related to what Lori just said too, I just want to mention a new collaboration that has been initiated by Professor Brenda Child, which is an interdepartmental collaboration between the Art and American Indian Studies Department, the George Morrison Center for Indigenous Arts. And we're very excited about that because not only is it the visual arts, but it's really looking at music and dance and um, different ways the cultural arts are included um, and being recognized. And so again, um, Amelius's point about infrastructure, you know, how do we build the infrastructure and support around 
a new center like this, which, you know, just put on a, a really wonderful um, exhibition of 29 indigenous painters in the Nash Gallery. But I, I do think like how, what are the structures that will foster those collaborations once people, you know, are no longer there to, you know, be the director as Brenda is now. So, so just thinking more broadly about how we support this, this kind of work. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I'm not one for word clouds, but this conversation mm -hmm. is making me want a word cloud. <laughs> I just there's some wonderful themes coming through it in terms of infrastructure and relationships and trust. Um, and I want to turn to some audience questions um, and specifically a pair of questions. Well, I'm going to ask them one at a time because it is a terrible interviewing practice to throw two questions into the mix at once. Um, but they're from two different folks, but they feel related to me. And so um, one of our audience members asked, how did, how did you start in this kind of work? How did you get involved in this type of work? And specifically, what was the start that got you out of a disciplinary track um, that is so central to how higher education is organized? Um, if you sort of think back and unpack how did I, at what point did I step over here and say, this is, this is the work? Well, for me, it didn't start from an artistic necessarily background, but from a community activism. And I started working with a group um, in the uh, Bay Area in San Francisco about uh urban agriculture in the early 90s. And I saw the power of people coming together to who cared about their community and wanted to, as um, Lori used the word transform, you know, to pres you know, also to steward land um, that had been farmed in the past. And that really reoriented me in terms of my entire practice because I could see how people from different disciplines and lived experiences could create change in their community and then was able to integrate that into my artistic practice moving forward. It's a really cool story. Thank you for sharing, Chris. I think for me, and again, I, I wouldn't say that I had this experience and then it put me on this path, but I think it was a, a formative experience when I think about it. Uh, my first job, one of my first two jobs at the university as a graduate assistant was working in uh, what's now called the Aurora Center. They provide support for victims of, of uh, sexual assault and relationship violence. And we were charged with developing, uh, essentially it was a presentation about sexual assault, but we used, we worked with the theater department. We used actors to kind of present uh, these scenarios and they would, you know, so rather than just going to do a presentation to student organizations, student athletes, fraternities and sororities, et cetera, we would, uh, we would do, there was a presentation aspect, but there was also, they got to see a little theater. Uh, and again, just an interesting way of, of addressing an issue, you know, and, and interdisciplinary, although again, at the time, didn't use that language, didn't think about it that way, but that was like my, probably my earliest exposure to uh, kind of crossing organizational and, and even, um, you know, disciplinary boundaries to address a problem. Uh, and it was successful. We, we uh, were asked to talk about it or, or present about it at conferences. Uh, because it was at the time and in, in the early '90s, it was it was unique and something people were interested in. How about you, Lori? I, I don't think I have quite as compelling a story um, as either one of you. Um, so I I think there was kind of by the time I I was in grad school here at the U and, and I think there's already a foundation of um, thinking about interdisciplinarity in my graduate program um, in anthropology. Um, 
And then I think the piece that was really critical for me to move in this direction was that I had a fellowship um, through the Sawyer Seminar. I had a fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Study, um, which was, again, a place where I just felt surrounded by this energy and was talking to people from across all of these different disciplines. And a couple of community partners as well were part of that work um, and, and part of the fellowship experience. And so I was talking to them about my work, and they were giving me feedback from their perspectives and their different fields. And, and for me, that was... Um, really critical and, and, um, became part of, um, became part of the foundation of what became open rivers. That's that seminar was part of that foundation. And then I just felt lucky enough that I got to kind of be pulled along with that and, and found my place in the work. I love that story. And I also think it's just a general rule. It is really important that we don't only tell like our magical moment stories, but also our everyday stories about how we got onto our paths. Um, otherwise, we're sending the message that you have to have some sort of like epiphanatic moment that <laughs> launches you into your career. And sometimes it's just little steps every day. Um, so I'm going to do a time check. We've got about five minutes left, but I want to really quickly ask the second half of this question, which comes from somebody who has been engaging as an inter and transdisciplinary researcher for eight years. They're currently a postdoc and they're looking for that next stable position, but they're finding it hard to position themselves in applications. What advice do you have for anyone in the audience who's an early career interdisciplinary um, scholar or practitioner navigating the job market? Well, that is a challenge, I would say, but also I think, you know, looking for uh, programs or institutions that do recognize that kind of practice. And I do think that institutions are changing and there are more opportunities than there were in the past. Um, and also then just I think, you know, as, as we do networking with people who are involved in interdisciplinary practices, um, you know, I think through the Institute for Advanced Study, there are so many um, people who have experience who are residents from other places as well, who might be good resources to talk to. Um, but I, I do understand that there's challenges, but I also think there's opportunities that that haven't existed in the past. And so figuring out you know, how to frame your practice and, and framing it as an asset rather than a detriment that you are more multifaceted and willing to collaborate and cooperate with others what, rather than having a narrow disciplinary focus. So I, I, I think it's an asset, but I, I know sometimes it's making that, that case for oneself. And I would add just, and this is what I tell undergraduates when thinking about trying to talk about what they've done and putting it on their resume and the transferable skills, you know? So it's less important, like you worked at a specific place, but you learned collaboration. You learned, so speaking about what you're gaining, you know, uh, you know, what you did, but also your ability to work across, again, build bridges and working across departments and organizations. In, in with internal or or external I would I would like to believe those are things that are uh, that are important and and valued uh particularly in inside of academia and outside of academia mm -hmm. and I'm not sure this is going to be helpful but I'm going to say um I think given eight years of experience if I'm remembering that question right I I'm, I'm thinking there's probably a lot of different ways you can describe how you do the work and a lot of different ways that you can sort of appeal to um, spaces within dis different disciplines uh, in meaningful ways. And, and maybe that's the, the way to find a foothold in the door to then be able to do the work once you're there. Um, and finding the right institution that has sort of, like Chris was saying, the space for that kind of work, um, I think is important. But then finding just your way in by by really being able to focus that that piece that, um, or that application on, you know, the piece that really resonates for that particular job. Easier said than done. That's so worth it. As the richness of this conversation today has illustrated, um, 
we're at time. A sign of a good conversation when your time flies by far too fast. Um, I want to thank Amelius, Laurie, Chris. I'm so humbled that you joined in this conversation with me. Um, and it's been such a pleasure to hear your insights and all the stories that you've shared. So thank you um, from the bottom of my heart from the Institute on the Environment. And um, thank you to everybody who joined us today and all of the fantastic questions that you asked as well. Um, we are so appreciative that you came to this people and planet. I see a lot of hearts flowing up on our Zoom screen now. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank, thank you, you so much.